How about you? What's your story? Uh, the question caught me off guard from the back seat of my car. Uh, it was during a season of my life where there was just a lot up in the air. Uh, I had just finished my second master's degree. We were living in our friend's basement, and I was driving for Uber, the ride-sharing app that turns your personal car into a taxi. I, I love the experience of driving for Uber, uh, mainly because I love hearing people's stories. When people hopped in my back seat, I'd ask them what they do, where they're from, and everyone has a story, a unique thing, a unique narrative that defines who they are. But on this particular night, on the streets of South Boston, my passenger had turned the questions on me. How about you? Well, what's your story? And if you're like me, when you're asked a question like this, you start jumping through the hoops of all of your social circles. Your, your mind is just uh, trying to piece together a narrative. Well, well I'm a husband. I, I live in Massachusetts, but I'm from Maryland. I'm a graduate of three theological institutions. My, my wife and I make videos on YouTube. I'm looking for a pastoring job. Uh, I'm part of a church in Lexington. I drive for Uber on the weekends, and there in that moment, uh, as my brain tried to piece together a narrative, a, a cohesive story, I replied to the passenger, I'm still trying to figure that out. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you were just still trying to figure out what your story is? I think no matter where we find ourselves in life, whether we're youngsters or we're veterans at this whole life thing. We all try to figure out our story, our narrative, what makes us who we are. And when we're asked a question like that, we, we try to figure out, oh, okay, in this situation, what, what's my primary hat that I wear? Am I a husband? Am I a father? Am I a wife? Uh, my child, am I, is it my role in my workplace? Is it my role at the church? Is it, what, what, what's primary when it comes to telling my story? I imagine that as Peter wrote to the church in the first century, that they were trying to figure out their narrative. I mean, Jesus had just left the whole Seen and he had, he had started a revolution. They called it the church. And here they are. They, many of them are from a Jewish background and they've, they've accepted Jesus as their Messiah. And others, they, they have, have come to put their faith in this revolutionary Jesus who said the kingdom of God is now for all people. And as they, as they tried to figure out their, their story, Peter writes to them. And we come to our passage this morning. I invite you to open up to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. I mean, I'm sorry, verses 4 through 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. And what I think that Peter wants us to get this morning, as we think about our stories and our narrative, and especially the narrative of Jesus and, and what he does in the world, I think that Peter wants us to understand that when we come to Jesus, he changes our identity. He gives us a new identity, and with that comes a new narrative, a new story. And so as we take a look at this passage this morning, I want us to ask three questions. The first question I want us to ask is, what does it mean to come to Jesus? Because I said, when we come to Jesus, he gives us a new identity and a new narrative. But what does it mean to come to Jesus? And then what is our new identity? And then what is our new narrative? So take a look at verse 4. It says, as you come to him, the living stone Rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, 
offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. At the foundation of this passage is the reality that Jesus is the living stone. Peter uses a metaphor here, and it's building off of the, remember, remember in the first chapter of 1 Peter, that the main thrust of what he gets is that living hope, the reality that Jesus rose from the dead, gives us a hope that doesn't die. The reality of living hope changes, changes our lives. And here he, he uses that living idea to root us back to the resurrection, root us back into that living hope to say, Jesus is the living stone. It's this metaphor that he uses, and it's used throughout all of Scripture to describe a, a cornerstone, that, that, that strong foundation. You, you, you see, in, in the passages that Peter quotes here, it describes the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's the, it's the picture of uh, you're at a building site. They're, they're about to put, put in the foundation. And they've got, they brought in a, just a whole pile of rocks. And the builders are there looking through the rocks. It's kind of like the kids trying to figure out which piece they're going to put here on the bottom. And, and, and as they look through the rocks, they, they, they see this one. It's been cut and ready, but they, they pass over it. They say, that's not the one. They choose something else. And what Scripture tells us in, the, in these passages that Peter quotes here is that Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected. But he's become the cornerstone. And, and here in, in Peter's flow of thought, what he wants us to get here is that everybody is building their life on something. Everybody is building a foundation. However you live your life, we are all building a narrative that shapes who we are, the narrative that we tell about our lives. And Peter says, as you come to him, the living stone, you're given a new identity, you're given a new narrative, but what it means to come to Jesus means to forsake everything else that we once regarded as precious. To forsake everything else that we once build it, built our lives on. You see, we can build our lives on this idea that if we have the best family, then, then that, will be, that will be success a successful life. And a lot of people live with that kind of foundation for their life. If I can, if I can raise that perfect family... Then, then my life will be complete. And, and, and what this passage is teaching us is that that is not a solid foundation. A lot of people live on the foundation that if I can build a successful, uh, secure financial future, then, then my life will be complete. What scripture tells us is that is not a sure foundation. A lot of people build, build their, their lives around the idea of successful social relationships. That if people like me, and I become a respectable person in society, if I do good, then that will be a successful life. But that is not a solid foundation. Peter tells us, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are built into a spiritual house. You're given a new identity, a new narrative, and Jesus becomes the only sure foundation for our lives. So what it means to come to him, take a look at verse 7. It says, now to you who believe, this stone is precious. Now this is significant. What, what Peter is telling us and what I think the Spirit of God wants to teach us today is that what it means to build our life on the stone of the foundation of Jesus is to hold him in the work of that he accomplished for us at the cross and the hope that he gives us to hold that as more precious to us than anything in this world. 
As you believe in him, you put your belief in him. But, but he, here, here's the thing. Building your life on Jesus does not mean he fits into your narrative. It means you get a whole new one. It means your story is now shaped around the reality that Jesus is more precious to me than anything in this world. And if, I, I'm, I, if I'm truly going to build my life on the rock, on the, on the living stone of Jesus, I have to really take inventory of what, where my treasure is, of where my heart is. And I'll be honest, there are days and moments in my days where I'm holding things more precious to me than Jesus. And Peter's pushing us here to say, as you come to him, as you live your life, as you grow up into your salvation, as he said in the passage right before this, as you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, build your life upon this rock that's more precious than anything in this world. Everybody in this room Everybody, if you're watching this online, you are building your life on something. And let me encourage you that when you build your life on Jesus, the most precious and chosen foundation in all of the universe, when you build your life on the hope that he died for you, He took your place at the cross because we couldn't live up to the the standards that God had for us. And what he accomplished for us brought us back into union with God. When we build our lives upon that, let me tell you, it's more precious than anything in this world. A stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So as you come to Jesus, as you build your life upon him, meaning making him the most precious thing in your life, you're given a new identity. Notice what he says down in verse 8. Oh, actually, verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And th- this is... This is rooted in the language of the Old Testament. It's rooted in the language of the prophets. It's rooted in the language of a people that God has created. And and here Peter's writing to people who are in this identity crisis. They're trying to figure out their narrative because they're saying, well, once God had chosen the people of Israel, but now he's extended it to the Gentiles. And now he's creating this kingdom where all can come to Jesus and be part of what he's doing. And they can... They can have their lives changed and he's now the cornerstone and they're trying to figure out their narrative. And what what Peter wants us to get this morning is that when we come to Jesus and when we build our lives upon him, the identity that we get as the people of God is the greatest story, it's the greatest narrative, it's the greatest social identity that we have. It's greater than your role as a husband, as a wife, as a person in society. It's greater than your role at work. You see, God is creating something categorically new by creating a new community which he has called the church. In verse 5 he says, you also like living stones. He goes on with this building metaphor to say, Okay, Jesus is the foundation, but you, each of you, if you put your faith in Jesus, you are bricks in the building of the church. And so here in, in our culture, we've become accustomed to calling this building the church. But Peter's saying, these walls, this woodwork, these stained glass windows, as beautiful as they are, That's not the church. You are living stones. You are the pieces of God's building, this structure that he's creating. And and notice what he says the purpose of this structure is. It's built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. 
Now, the priesthood is, is rooted in the language of the Old Testament and, and God's, God's design for how we approach God. And the priests were the only ones who could enter God's presence, who could have a relationship with Him, who could communicate with God. And this is what he says. When we build our lives on Jesus, you have access to God. You as a church, as, as living stones built together become a place where we commune with God, where we have a relationship with Him. And what Peter wants us to get in terms of our new identity is that it is interdependent upon each other. This new community that God's created, it's living stones built together. Picture bricks being laid together. And they're dependent upon each other. They bear the weight of each other. And that is what God says that the church does. That you, the people, the, br the bricks of the church are built together as living stones to be a place where God meets with his people. To be a place where, where, where we declare the praises of God. Where we build each other up. There's an old story of a Spartan king who uh, has a visiting uh, ambassador from another monarch come and uh, see his kingdom. And the Spartan uh, king is showing him around and, and this, this ambassador says, well, maybe tomorrow you can take me to see the city walls, to see the walls of your kingdom. And, and so the, the Spartan king says, okay, so tomorrow we'll go see it. And... Um, the next day they, they meet outside the city and there, there is this Spartan army and they're, they're standing outside the city and the ambassador says, um, Where, where's the walls? And the king says, behold the walls of Sparta, every man a brick. The walls of Sparta were not a physical wall. It was an army of men and women. And so it is with the church. And, and I hope that it can be true of us that when someone walks into this church building, into this house of worship, then says, this is a beautiful church. Look at the woodwork. Look at the stained glass windows. That, that we might turn their gaze to the people and say, behold the church. Every man, every woman, a living stone. This is the beauty of what God is doing. He gives us a new identity where our identity, in the, where our place in the people of God, this, this chosen people, is greater than our identity in this world. And what that means, and this is hugely important as we think about um, our society and how we as a church have a role in our society, is that the people of God... This categorically new story that God is doing, this new identity, it's greater than our ethnic identity. It's greater than where we're from. It's greater than what we look like. It's greater than our original language. And what the people of God does, it brings people together from every place of the earth to say, your identity here on this earth is secondary to your identity in the people of God. And so the church becomes this multicolored, multi-ethnic people group of people from every nation, every people group coming together to say our identity as the chosen people of God is greater than our identity as an American. It's greater than my identity as oh, in a political affiliation. It's greater than my identity in my house, in my community, in my workplace. This is the greatest story, the greatest narrative that is being told. So when we come to Jesus, when we build our life on him as the most precious thing in our lives, he changes our identity. And notice that he changes our narrative. Take a look at verse 9 as it continues. It says, you are... God's chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is our story. If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, he says this is your narrative. To tell, the, to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He says, once you were not a people, you were a nobody. But God has made you a new people, a new, he's made you a, a, a brick in this huge structure, this thing called the church, this movement, this part of the kingdom of God where Jesus is at work in the world today. And he says, you were a nobody, but now you're a somebody because Jesus has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And this is your new story. He says, once you, you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. And I encourage you, the, these verses, verses 9 and 10, I remember early in my journey of faith, I came across this passage. I was reading through the book of 1 Peter, and I came to this passage and realized that this is the greatest, it, it's the narrative of my life. There's a lot of ways I could shape my narrative. There's a lot of hats that I wear in my, in my social circles. But this, this is my identity. That I've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So how about you? What's your story? I hope that the next time I'm asked that question, that I could say, you know what? I was once a nobody. I was a nobody. But now I'm a somebody. Because God showed me mercy. And he called me out of darkness. Out of this, this cloudy... Uh, place where I couldn't figure out my identity, but, but now Jesus is more precious to me than anything in this world. And this is my story, that I'm just telling the praises of him who called me out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And what I think Peter was encouraging his, his, his readers with here as they try to figure out what their story is in the world and how they relate to their culture as they're living in a foreign land, what I think he wants them to get is that this whole Christian thing, this whole Jesus changes our life thing, it's not, it's not something like deeply um, academic or it's not something you uh, have to uh, have this long uh, intellectual argument about. It's simply telling your story. It's simply saying, this is what my life was before Jesus. And this is who I am now. So how about you? What's your story? Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for this word. I thank you that Jesus is more precious than anything in this world. And that you give us a living hope. And that changes our identity. It changes our narrative. And Lord, we thank you that you have called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light where we now have a, a hope. A hope that does not die at the grave, but it extends beyond the grave. And I, Lord, I pray that we would walk in that hope. That we would walk in this new identity. And Lord, I pray for anyone in, in, in this room or who's watching online who has never put their faith in you, who said, Jesus, you are more precious to me than anything. That your sacrifice at the cross and paying the price for my sin and giving me life through your resurrection, that I want to make this the foundation of my life. Lord, I pray that they would come to you. Say, Jesus, you are everything. Lord, thank you for what you're doing here and building us together as living stones, as a part of your grand narrative. Lord, thank you that you are not a part of our story, but you invite us to be a part of our story. 
a, a part of your story. And we become part of your greater narrative. We thank you for it and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.